Well, uh, now it's time to hear from the, the Word of God. Uh, Pastor Mark is not here. I looked around and he was nowhere to be found, so we're just going to, at the last moment, call on Richard Taylor and see if he has a word for us. <laughs> uh, fact is, uh, Mark called him last night and said to him, hey, would you share uh, the Word with us because I'm feeling very poorly. And so uh, he agreed to do that. Chris, uh, Chris, you called him Old Faithful, didn't you? And so he's back again. Um, he's been our pastor. If you're new to us here, Pastor Taylor was uh, here just after Moses was born. And uh, for a lot of years, he, uh, he led us uh, wonderfully. And uh, so we're always pleased when Pastor Taylor is able to come and uh, share the word with us. And so he's about to do that now. On a time... Tim Cowan was a pup, okay? It's, uh, let, me, uh, let me throw that in. I know that Mark is sorry that he couldn't, uh, that he couldn't be here, but uh, it uh, allows me the privilege of being here, and it certainly is a privilege, and I'm delighted in it. I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'd like to read that to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Back in my sordid days, I grew up on a farm, uh, many of you knew that, and uh, every fall we went deer hunting, and one particular year my, my father and my brother and I went, were hunting together, and uh, there, were, there was a patch of woods, and normally what you'd do when there was a patch of woods is uh, a couple of them would go out there and drive through the woods and drive the deer out. And my job, of course, was to, to be out there with my 30-30 carbine, and if any deer came through, I was supposed to shoot them. So uh, on this particular day, that's exactly what was happening. They were, they were working through the woods, and I was the shooter, and I, there was a roadway so I could see this way and I could see this way. and So I would, I would watch this way, and then I would watch this way, and I would watch this way, and I was looking this way, and I turned around just in time to see a deer go, and it was so fast, I didn't have a shot. I was looking the other way, and it got by me. I tell that story because something like that happens with the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Something like that happens. The Corinthians were looking the wrong way. They were looking the wrong way. They were focused on what we call spiritual gifts. And of course, they're there. They really are, and, and they're important, or we wouldn't be talking about them, or God wouldn't be talking about them. But they were, they, that had captured their attention. And they were looking at that so, so intently. They were so focused on that that they were missing the significance of love. When people hear 1 Corinthians 13, 
they often hear it as a, as a kind of a standalone, but it isn't. It's part of a three chapter statement about what God wants and what he wants us to do. It starts in chapter 12 and it ends in chapter 14. Many don't connect chapter 13, the love chapter, to what goes before and what comes after. You see chapter 13 quoted in Valentine cards, the, the text, or you will hear it read as a text at weddings, but it's always alone. It's not connected to chapter 12 and to chapter 14. Again, the problem is the Corinthians were distracted. They were looking the wrong way. The spiritual gifts had become the center of their attention. And it was creating a problem. And, and, and that's what they were talking about. And that's what they were trying to understand. That's what they were trying to work through. God said, you need to see what is core. You're missing the core. And so God lays out these truths this way. These, these truths about spiritual gifts and how love is related to them. The chapter ends by saying, the greatest of these is love. So if you think I'm just kind of, you know, pulling this out, no. Paul says, the greatest of these is love. The next chapter begins, chapter 14, pursue love. So you can see the focus of, of what's being said here, what's being said. See, being distracted can make us focus on the wrong things. Uh, it, they're there, they're important, but we get focused in perhaps an unhealthy way on the wrong things. So this chapter is a reminder that the core of Christian, well, we, we could generalize it and say of Christian ministry, the core is love. That's what it's all about. And Paul said, you've gotten distracted by all this stuff. Let's, let's get it straight, okay? Spiritual gifts, yes, God has given them. And yes, they are a blessing in the church. But the core of it, don't forget, the core is love. Those who seek to follow Jesus today are facing all kinds of distractions. We're facing all sorts of distractions. Let's just start by making sure that we're, we're using the same language, okay? Love is an attitude, not an emotion. Love is an attitude. Now, commonly, when people talk about love, they're talking about having good feelings for someone. So when someone says, I love you, what we sort of commonly understand is, I have good feelings about you. When I think of you, it makes me happy. It makes me feel good. I love you. Okay, that's, that's the way that uh, the, we've come to understand love. So that's, that's why people often talk about falling in love. Um, that, that language, falling in love, has been around for a long time, but it has always produced a picture for me, and I can't help myself. Um, you know, I, I enjoy hiking, and so, so I, when, when someone says they fell in love, I picture them hiking down a, you know, a wooded trail, and they're just walking along, <laughs> kind of enjoying myself, looking at the trees, seeing all the beautiful stuff, just walking along, and all of a sudden, poof, there was a hole there and I didn't see it, and I fell in love. <laughs> People are saying, I'm going through life, everything's good, I'm enjoying myself, and poof, I fell into a hole. There she was, or there he was. I fell in love, okay? And uh, uh, it's, it's just a, 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 I'm sorry, it's the picture that comes into my mind, and it's a, a strange thing. The proof that they fell in love are all the good feelings they have. I was, I was walking along minding myself and I met this person and oh, there was this flood of good feelings. This flood just over, it, it, it must be love. 
it must be love because I have all these good feelings. <sighs> well, the problem is the good feelings end. And, uh, you know, n now what? Uh, we don't use the terminology that I fell out of love. Every now and then somebody says that, I fell out of love. You know, you fall in love, you fall out of love, okay? The point there is suddenly the hole I fell in doesn't have any good feelings anymore, so I crawl out of it. And, uh, you know, I'm not in love anymore. I'm not anymore. The, the, I, I climbed out of the hole. But we need to understand, and the reason I'm focused here is so that we, that we understand the same, we're using the same word, the same language. Love is, is not a feeling. Love is an attitude. Love is a commitment. That's what we mean by love. Now, if you turn to John chapter 14, John chapter 14, Jesus said something that um, uh, uh, is significant in this regard. Jesus said, John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, Jesus did not say, if you love me, you will feel good about me. When they mention my name, you'll go, oh, isn't that nice? Uh, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will do what I say. You will understand my significance. You will, do, you will do all that. Your love for him is seen in your commitment to do and honor and see the significance of what he says. That's what it means to love Jesus, okay? Understanding this can help you avoid the distraction that the Apostle Paul is trying to get at here in 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus has not called you to like people. Jesus has not called you to feel good about people. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I don't want to imply, uh, you know, I, I am really glad for the people around me that, that, that I like, and, and a whole bunch of you are in this room, okay? I like you! And I appreciate you because I like you, okay? I appreciate you because I like you. So there's nothing wrong with that. But that isn't the essence of love. The call of Jesus is to love, not simply to like people. It calls us to love. First Corinthians is a beautiful First Corinthians 13 is a beautiful statement. Many people have noticed the, the marvelous poetry of it. And they've They've used it as an example to say that, you know, the, the, apostle, the apostle Paul wasn't just a bumbler and so on. This is a, a, a beautiful poetry. That's why it gets quoted so often. It's so beautiful. It's a beautiful statement. But you will miss the significance of it if you only see it as the text of a Valentine card. You will miss the significance of it. We are to pursue love. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tells us what love thinks, tells us how love acts, tells us what love does, doesn't tell us to like people. It tells us what to do, to love. That's what it's about. Now, we have a tendency to love different people in different ways. Um, love comes easy for people who love you. It's easy to love people who love you. Now, there are people in your life who love you. Uh, probably you think immediately of your family, or I hope you're able to think immediately of your family. You know, father, mother, husband, wife, children, uh, people in your family. Uh, you sense and appreciate that they, that they love you. And, and, and you know that. You know that by how they treat you. Uh, you know that by by the, the, the strong association you have with them. Uh, you might be blessed <laughs> and include on the, on the list of people that you believe love you, your, uh, your, your friends, uh, your neighbors, maybe even some of your coworkers. Uh, you know, it, these are the kinds of people you really like. You, well, you're glad to have them around you and you know that you can count on them. You know that they love you and it's easy to love them. 
no problem, whatever. But love is not so easy when you start to consider the people who don't love you. It's not quite so easy. Uh, now, you may be a nice person, but you would be a rare person if there wasn't somebody somewhere who doesn't like you or doesn't appreciate what you do. So it's going to be a very rare person who uh, doesn't have somebody somewhere who just d doesn't love you. They are harder to love. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, often you can just ignore them or avoid them. And that is often the strategy for dealing with people you don't love. Avoidance, just stay away, just stay away from them. Then you don't have to go, go through all the stuff that, uh, that you go through. Uh, they, are harder, they are harder to love, they are harder to love. Love does not exist when you face people who think of you as an enemy. That's just about impossible. How do you love people who treat you as an enemy? Now, the problem is, right now, we are surround we, and I'm talking about followers of Jesus, are surrounded by people who have very different values and very different ideas about life than you do. Very different. So, for example, they consider abortion a right. And you, when you seek to oppose abortion, and when you seek to do that, you are, you are denying women their rights. And you are the enemy. Oof. I, perhaps you've been in those conversations. They're, they're, they're kind of uncomfortable. You know that you are the bad guy. You are the bad guy. You don't care about women. Misogynist. That's, uh, that's what you are. You are painted that way. When you mention to someone that you think that homosexual activity is a problem, immediately you are labeled as being a person who uses hate speech. We hear this, we hear this kind of language. And you are the bad guy. You are the enemy. You are imposing your morality on people who don't want it. You're the enemy. You're the enemy. The difficulty of this last group that I'm talking about is how easily hatred and division creeps into those sorts of situations, how easy it happens. Um, it is so easy to get an argument started. Uh, you, 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 you hardly have to work at it if you're out talking with people. You get the argument started. Climate change. Is climate change a reality? Well, the conservative says, uh, no. Nah. Climate change is, is, is just a construction of them liberal politicians down there in Washington trying to, trying to create it. Guess what? Your argument is going. You, you hardly have to work at it. COVID vaccinations? <sighs> Lack of faith. If you had faith, you wouldn't need a, get a COVID vaccination. You wouldn't need it. But... Uh, what about all those other vaccinations we had that were so helpful, the polio vaccine and the, and the tetanus shot and so on? It, 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 you know, it's, the argument starts, it's so easy. Giving out money, you know where inflation is coming from? Government dumping money. They dumped money. And if they would people would go out and get a job instead of waiting to get government checks, we'd be all right. 
But somehow them politicians again, they got it in their mind they're going to give out money and guess what? How much did you pay for your last ga ca uh, a tank of gas? Okay. Mm -hmm. We got it going. It's just almost anything you mention. You can find an argument and you can get the argument going. And they do and they do go. It goes that way. Well... When these arguments begin, and my point is they really do begin very easily. When these arguments begin, love is no longer the focus. Love is no longer the concern. Love is no longer even important. But 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is to be at the core of our interaction with people. It's to be at the core of it. It's what we do. Putting all your attention on measuring spiritual gifts, Paul said, distracts from the central issue. Now, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with spiritual gifts. That's why we need to talk about them. But when you get focused on them and somehow blow them way out of proportion, you will miss the significance of a core value of the Bible a core value that God wants you to have, and that value is love. And 1 Corinthians 13 says, here's what we're talking about. Here's what we're talking about. Those who follow Jesus know that love is the core. Love is the core. We have to be careful about making right or making being right the focus of our interaction with people. When we're in arguments, when we're in debates, we want to be right, okay? And so I will continue until you admit that I'm right. And the argument goes on, and it goes on. We've got to be careful about that. Now, does that mean that we should not seek what is true and right. We must never surrender the truth of God. We must never budge an inch. We've got to be clear about that. The truth of God is absolute and undeniable. What God has said is true, absolutely true, true everywhere, true all the time, has always been true. We need to understand that. Many of your spiritual ancestors died defending what is true. And how can we, knowing that, be willing to surrender what is true? But if you make the desire to be right the core of what drives you, you will bring division you will bring division. The Bible makes it clear that holding to the truth, yeah, it's going to bring division. You can't avoid it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You may be despised. You may be accused of hate speech. You may be accused of all of that when you share your thoughts. And it may make you feel very uncomfortable. And it may make you angry. And it may, may make you want to be right and shut everybody down. It may do that to you. But the desire to be right, the knowledge that you are right, does not diminish the call to love. It does not diminish the call to love. The Corinthians' emphasis on showing the spiritual gifts caused them to miss the core. Would you turn back to 1 Corinthians 13? Turn back there again. Just, just look, at those, look at those first three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbals. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now, is there something wrong with speaking in the tongues of men? No. 
There's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. If I have prophetic powers, is, is there something wrong with that? No, nothing wrong with that. Understand all mysteries? Well, there's still a few mysteries I don't understand, but even if I did, would there be something wrong with that? No, no, nothing wrong with that. If I have all faith, you got a problem with that? Something wrong with that? If I give away all that I have, give my body to be burned, that's the one that always gets me. Give my body to be burned. You, you, you can't do much more than that. You can't mu do much more than that. But in every case, you can do these things which are so good, you can do them worthlessly without love. If they are without love, you're a gong. You're nothing. You're nothing. Doing good things. Without love, these things were empty and they were useless because they lacked the core of love. And like I said, the one that blows my mind, would you give your body to be burned? Uh, that's not something I want to do this afternoon, I can tell you that, okay. Uh, I wouldn't. But if somehow I were called on to do that, but I couldn't do it out of love, it would be absolutely useless. It would be absolutely useless. The bottom line is that the good things they were doing were, distract, were distracted. They were not love. Being right does not eliminate the call of love. Love needs to be the core of what it means to serve Jesus. Love needs to be the core. Now, there will be no lack of people who disagree with you and dislike you because of your commitment to God, to the Lord Jesus and the gospel, there will be no lack of people who will dislike you because of that. Our secular culture, as a matter of fact, continues to think that many of the problems that we're facing today come because of the teaching of the Bible. That means you Christians, you are the problem. We were okay, but you came along insisting on your biblical morality. If you didn't have your biblical, if you didn't insist on your biblical morality, we wouldn't have all these problems. I mean, you're ignorant. You go around thinking that God created the universe? Are you serious? Come on. We dismissed that a long time ago. When you say that homosexual activity is problematic, it's just revealing your hatred of human beings. That's what you're doing. When you insist on doing what the Bible teaches, you're just following outdated morality. The Bible is 2,000 years old. How can something that's 2,000 years old tell us what to do today? See what I mean? See what I mean? Love is not easy when you're listening to things like this, when you're listening to things like this. We will want to uphold the things of God. We will want to do that. But if focusing and insisting on being right and, 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 and somehow the, having that recognition can be a distraction. Our focus, even when we are attacked, needs to stay in the core which is love. That's where our focus needs to be. It needs to be on love. You don't have to surrender your convictions. You don't have to give up the, the, the expectations of God. You don't have to surrender the truth. You don't need to do that. It will be helpful for you to remember that you're not the first one who had to face this. And our generation isn't the first who faced this. It's a long-standing problem. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. In many ways, what we are facing is what the early church faced. 1, Corinthians, or 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, 
always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So God calls us to keep love at the core. To keep love at the core. Holding to the truth but not showing the love of Christ is worthless. The love of Christ must be core. Holding the truth, well, it can just be empty words. It can just be empty words. We can show God's love without surrendering the truth. Um, now I'm getting tired of hearing about the pandemic. Uh, you probably are too. We keep hoping it's over, but we've talked about it. And uh, we know people who've been sick and even died from it. Well, I want to tell you, there is a spiritual pandemic. And it's affecting our churches. I read about churches Churches like ours that, that claim the Bible as the word of God and the truth. And they're divided. They're divided. They're arguing about things. Politics. Masks. No masks. It's still going on. It's still going on. And it's sad. It's sad. Because obviously love is not at the core. What is happening in our divided government is just a symptom of what's going on everywhere. Uh, there are Republicans, there are Democrats, and they don't agree on anything. And that's, that's how it is. Believers and unbelievers are divided. But again, sadly, division has reached into our churches, has reached into our churches. Don't let the desire to be right. Don't let the desire to win the argument distract you from God's call to love. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Again, let's look. John chapter 15. Or John chapter 13, excuse me. This is the word to, to take with you. John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what Jesus is saying is people are going to know you're his disciples, not because you win the argument, not because you prove you are right. Jesus said they will know you are disciples because you have love. People will know you are a follower of Jesus, not because you are right, but because you reflect the love of God. That needs to be the core of what we do and what we talk about. Let's pray. Lord, it is hard. We listen to people who tell us that what we think, what we believe, uh, is the problem. And yes, indeed, they are angry. And in some cases, it's even possible to say they hate us. And it would be so easy, Lord, to respond to them in that way. Help us, Lord. Help us to show love. We don't want to be a clanging gong. We don't want empty words to come out of our mouth. Help us, Lord, that the way we live, the way we talk, the way we show ourselves, the way we interact with people will show how you loved us and allow them to see your love through us. Use us in that way, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.